But good, uh, good afternoon. It's good to see everybody this wonderful April 2nd. Anybody get any April Fool's stuff done on them yesterday? No? Boy, oh boy. Nothing new, huh? Everybody's just, just got something old. I don't think you like it. Yeah. I know you can't. Maybe that's it, huh? Anyway, welcome everybody. You know, um... This right here, what I've been um, what I've been doing over at the church, has been a seven sermon series of church. I mean, uh, of sermons. Seven sermon series. Try to say that real fast a few times. <laughs> seven sermon series. What we've been studying over there is seven steps to freedom in Christ. Freedom in Christ. Listen, we all want freedom, don't we? And I'm going to tell you something. We, a lot of times we think we're free, but we're not. We got something hanging on it. Something on our back. Some, now, you know, even the world calls it, you got a monkey on your back. You know, when you got something on your back, what does it do? It's holding you down. It's weighing you down. It's not letting you do what you want to do. Amen? I remember the monkey. I, I had three monkeys on my back. Man, I tell you. And every last one of them was costing me all my money. Just holding me down. Messed me up so bad, couldn't pay any rent. Couldn't keep a job. Just messing me up. So all of us, we all are ending up with something on us. Something holding us down. Amen? And so one of the main things that we need to do is come to understand what that is. And then I want you to understand that Jesus created you to be free from that. Amen? And when he frees you, you know what he says? When the Son frees you, you are free indeed. So before we get started, let's open up with a word of prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you so much for all that you're doing. Thank you for this beautiful day. You've given us, Lord. We are here. As we got a little shade on us over here. And, and Father, I pray that you bring a nice cool breeze in amongst my brothers and sisters that are sitting out here in the sun that are a little bit warm. Cool them down, Lord. It would be very nice. We'd appreciate it. But I also want to thank you, Lord, that even in the shade, we got a little warmth and everything is going good. So, Father, be with us today. Open up our minds and hearts so that we can receive this word. 
Lord, we had a really, really good um, reception of this word over Central City, and I pray that everybody here will be able to get it also. Hold on to it. And so, Lord, allow me to step back and out of the way while you step forward. Have a personal word with your children. May I decrease while you increase. Thank you, Lord, for just allowing me to be a part of what you're doing here. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. May everybody's hearts and minds be open. May they receive this where it would help them to walk closer with you once we leave here. That it would be on their minds. And we pray for all of that in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I wanted to speak to you today from the title of this sermon. It's called Acquiescence Versus Renunciation. And if you want to know what that's all about, ac uh, acquiescence it has to do with just standing by and letting things happen. Giving up. You know what I mean? Just giving up and letting something happen in front of you. And renunciation is when we renounce whatever it is. So it's one against the other. One against the other. And we're going to put that together here today. My focus statement of the day is that why should we suffer from the past? Let us clear the slate and start fresh with our God. Amen? Why should we carry around stuff that's been holding us down? That's what I'm talking about, these monkeys on our back. Why should we carry that stuff around? Yeah, that's right, drugs. Drugs is one of them. But you know something? There's a whole lot of other. There's drugs, there's alcohol, there's sexual stuff. Things that apply to your flesh. What your flesh likes. Okay? Yeah, grudges. That's right, all kinds of stuff. Function statement of the day is that ignorance is not bliss. To sit quietly by while sin is being committed is just as bad as committing that sin yourself. Amen? In other words, we don't want to just stand around. We don't want to just stand around and let things happen in front of you without at least saying something. Standing up. Coming against sin. Coming against it. And let me tell you something. When you don't do it, Something happens that sticks with you for the rest of your life. Trust me. And I'm going to share something about that with you. Have you ever sat by and let sin have its way right in front of you? Has that ever happened to you? Yeah? Amen? Just something happening right in front of you and you just sit there and let it happen. Now, I don't want... What is it you're saying? I don't want to get involved. I don't want to get involved. I, people might think that I'm a square. Yeah. Why should I put myself at risk? Sound familiar? Does that sound like here? I, I could get hurt. Is that what's doing it? I just need to mind my own business. No, I'm sorry. I need to mind my own business. Is that what it is? Has that ever happened to you? Well, I'll tell you what, it's happened to me before. Let me tell you a little story. I was down at Hermosa Beach one day, and it was hot, real sunny, man. And I was walking around down there, you know, had my flip-flops on and shorts on and stuff. And I'm walking down, and I started crossing Hermosa Boulevard. And the streets were filled with people, people everywhere. And as I'm crossing the street, I came up, and there was a brand spanking new Mustang convertible. And two guys came out and they jumped in the car and they was both so tore up. I don't see how anybody could drink that much and still walk. But they was that tore up. Um, they were just messed up. They jumped in this car and the drunkest one was going to drive. Now as I'm walking across the street, I'm walking right by this guy's front, front door. And I'm thinking to myself, he started up the car, and I'm thinking, man, I should jump in there and take those keys. But I knew that if I leaned over into that man's car, I'm going to have to sock somebody up. Because he ain't going to let me take his keys that easily, you know what I mean? And it was two of them. And so I'm thinking, yeah, I, I might go ahead and do this because this is dangerous. 
But as I walked by, those same voices started talking to me. I might get hurt. I need to mind my own business. All these things, I kept hearing them. So what did I do? I walked right on by. And I let these guys start that car up and they started trying to get out and they're banging the cars and fronting in the back. Finally, he gets out and then starts tearing down the street. And all of a sudden I hear a, a big crash and people screaming and, and he had run off into the crowd on the sidewalk. All kinds of mess. And I'm sitting there going, oh no. And I thought to myself, what did I do? It's true that I wasn't driving. It's true that I wasn't the one drinking. But I should have did something. I had an opportunity to help, to stop somebody from doing something that was not only dangerous, but it was illegal. And what happened? A whole lot of people got hurt. I should have just reached into that car and turned off the ignition, removed the keys. Who knows? They might have just let me do it. But because I didn't try to do it, something terrible happened. That's what I should have done. And because I didn't, people got hurt. Now, I got to live with that indecision for the rest of my life. Tony, could you have done something? There might have been somebody that was crippled for the rest of their life. Why? Because I didn't do what I felt that I should do. My wife talks to me about it all the time. It wasn't your fault. You wasn't the one drinking. You wasn't the one toe down. Yeah. But I tell her, I said, look, you're trying to make me feel good? Just go in there and cook me a steak. <laughs> no, it wasn't my car. But to be real truthful with you, I, I still carry it around. I do feel a little, I, I, you know, I feel a little, I feel bad inside because I, I should have done something, you know? Anybody out there felt like that? If Has anything like that happened to you? Amen. So I, I got, I'm in good company, right? All right? Now I wonder how God feels about us just standing by while bad people do whatever they feel like doing. I mean, how does he feel when grievous sin is committed by family members or friends or, or uh, you know, people that just are, just have no consideration for his commandments. People that don't even believe that the, the commandments and things that have to do with God not even come to mind. I wonder how God feels about them because those committing those sins, they don't even care about God. They care nothing about God. They care nothing about it. They have nothing good to say about it. They don't think about His commandments. They don't think about anything. In fact, they hate God. Because God represents what? Authority. Somebody that they're going to have to stand before one day. That's what they do. They know that one day they're going to have to answer to someone for their sins. That they're going to have to bow down before sins that they committed against God and man. They're going to have to answer for it. So how does God deal with such a, sins like that? If you got your Bible, turn your Bible to Exodus 20 and we're going to read 1 through 6. And we're going to see what this is about as far as Old Testament is concerned. Now before I read this, I want you to understand. God looks at sin the same. The same then as he does now. But the way that he deals with it is different. Why? Because we're under a new covenant. We're under, and we're living in the, what they call the age of grace. So back here when Israel was doing what they were doing, things were different. There was a lot of stuff that God, uh, he took care of right away. And in a rough way. So let's see what it says here. One through six. Exodus 20, 1 through 6. It says, then, oops, I need my glasses. Man, what am I doing? I looked down, everything got blurry. All right. It says, then God spoke all these words, saying, 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. And you shall not worship them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Visiting is the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and the fourth generations of those who hate me. But showing loving kindness to thousands, to those who love me, keep my commandments. So you can see God, he dealt with things very seriously. And remember, you need to understand, God is what? He's the same today, tomorrow, and forevermore. So he feels about sin the same way as he always has. So God is very serious about sin that is committed against him to the point back then where he even charged it against whole family lines. Whole family lines affecting up to the third and the fourth generation. These are called generational curses. And we must take them seriously because we don't know what grandpa and grandma used to do. We don't know what great grandpa and great grandma used to do either. And if the truth be told, we don't even know what our own parents were up to. My father was an extremely wicked man. He was extremely sinful and godless. He was completely consumed by the hunger that was derived from his flesh. That was what he was all about. He didn't care about who he hurt in his quest for fleshly satisfaction. But when I was a young man, I thought that my dad was the coolest person I had ever seen. I wanted to be just like him. I wanted to be just like him. I remember when we, he, uh, back in, what was it, the late 60s, he was in the Navy, and he got orders to transfer to Guam. And so he decided, he says, he told my mom, he says, I'm going to go to Guam, I'm going to be there six months, I'm going to find a house and all that stuff, and then I'm going to send for the, you and the kids. So he, we're like, okay, so we waited patiently. Dad finally called us and said, okay, come on over. We went and got our shots and everything and then got on the plane and over to Guam we flew. When we got there, my dad says to me, he says, look, he says, I got to get my clothes out of the barracks. So he says, there are no, not no women up in there. So he says, come on, son. He says, you're going to go with me. So I went with my dad. I was like 15 years old. I went with him over there. We went in the barracks. He was getting his clothes and all that stuff and he hands me a box out of the closet. And I said, what's this? And he says, look. So I opened up the box and I looked and the box was filled with condoms. I looked at that and I went, what are you doing with these? This is the first time that I looked at something and I saw my father through different eyes. My father obviously was very busy over in Guam. And he was married to my mother, so it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me. That was the first red light that popped up. And then he began to school me. He was teaching me how men always kept those kinds of things secret. And he was teaching me how his son would keep these things secret from, his, from my mother. When we got back to San Diego, my father got a job. Not only was he in the Navy, he got a job bartending at Miramar Naval Air Station. He's making money, he's doing this, and I needed a job. So I went to him and said, hey, Pops, I need a job. I said, can I be your bar boy? Because I was 18 years old. Let me learn how to be your bar boy. So he says, okay, so they got me a job over there. Well, I'm watching my dad real close. He was a player. He was smooth. So I'm looking at Pops and I'm going, huh, I've learned how to do this. So I'm watching him, he's in a bar, and every time he's behind that bar, women were coming in, all kinds of, by the groves, they wanted to sit and talk to Art. They wanted to talk to the bartender. They wanted to do this. And I'm watching and I'm like, man, that's pretty cool. So I began to start 
trying to learn my game. You know, I'm trying to learn how to do my thing. Well, what a position has put me in. I'm watching my dad do all the stuff that he was doing, and it was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm keeping all this stuff a secret. Because why? Because I'm a good son. I didn't want to mess, mess with my dad. I didn't want to mess up his, you know, my home life and his home life. So I kept the secrets. Well, one day my dad was sitting at the table having dinner with this lady at the club. And in walks my mother. Oh, what a mess that was. Mom was yelling at him. Dad was trying to be cool. The lady was trying to get out of there. It was just bad. It was just back and forth. What a terrible thing it was. And you know, so I was sitting there and I was thinking, what if, you know, and I, my mother was making a scene and it just looked so bad. And then I thought to myself, man, and here I am keeping this secret from my dad. And I watched my mother, she was going through all this stuff and I'm thinking, man, this is, this is not good. This is not a good situation. But I was supposed to keep that secret. But let me tell you something, it's funny about sin. It turned out that I didn't have to say anything about my dad's secrets in the first place. You know why? Because sin will find you out. You hide it for a while, but all of a sudden it pops out of the closet. And before you know it, it makes itself known. Anybody ever been in that situation? You was, you was deep in sin, and all of a sudden, your sin got found out. Uh, you remember how you felt? That was messed up, wasn't it? Just mess. And you know what? I don't see all the women are just kind of standing around going like this. All the men are going, <laughs> yeah, I don't see. You know what? Some women have been messing up too. Ain't nobody getting off the hook. So that sin popped out and all of a sudden my father's indiscretions were made known. But you know what I saw? I saw my mother's heartbreak. Right in front of me. Her heart broke. And from that day forward, I stopped wanting to be like my dad. I didn't want to be like him anymore. I never wanted to crush a woman's heart like that and see her utterly destroyed and downtrodden. That's why to this day, I, try to, I go to extra things to make sure that my wife knows that I love her beyond compare. And that there's not a woman out here that makes a difference to me other than her. Amen. All right, you got to give me 10 bucks later. Martin, Martin Luther King said, and I quote, Not only will we have to repent for the sins of bad people, but we also will have to repent for the appalling silence of good people. What does that mean? When we don't say anything, when we see wrong, when we see sin, when we see crime happening right in front of us and we don't do anything about it, that's a sin of omission. We have not done anything. We've omitted it completely. We did not do what we should have done. That happens to us out here. That happens to us out here. Why? Because we're messing up. We don't want to be punks. We don't want to be rats and all that kind of stuff. Let me tell you something. If you see something that's hurting somebody else, you need to say something. You understand? And you don't have to necessarily go running off to the cops or anything like that. Stand up. Say something to the guy that's doing it. Because sometimes just the stuff that you say will change his mind. I had a guy on Facebook. He was talking bad about Christianity. He was talking all kinds of bad stuff about Jesus and said and cussed at my Lord and my Savior. Oh no. And he claimed to be a Christian. And I got right off Facebook and I shot one to him and I said, you should be ashamed of yourself. How can you talk and say something about the very man that hung on a cross, died and paid so that you could go to heaven? How can you do that? And you know what? He apologized. He changed the way that he was thinking. He changed the way that he was thinking. Listen, a lot of people don't want to come to Christianity because they think that Christianity is full of hypocrites. 
But that's okay. Come on and join us. We could use another one. <laughs> Listen, none of us are perfect, right? None of us. We all have sin in our lives. What is the whole thing about? It's all about trying to get our lives together. Amen? You are living in a ground in a uh, in a practice ground in a in a place where you're trying to get it right so you're working at it you're working at it but listen the more you work at it the better you're going to get it's not that you're going to become sinless just because you're a christian you're just going to sin less and that's what happens to us as you keep practicing, as you keep working at it. When I'm walking down the street, you would have jumped to the other side of the street because you wouldn't want to walk by me. And I'd have looked at you and I'd have said to myself, mm, you must owe me something. I'd be trying to figure out a way to get paid. So you need to understand. Abraham Lincoln said, to sin by silence, when they should protest, makes cowards of men. You know, Abraham Lincoln, he was a politician. And what he's telling you is that if you're seeing anything going wrong, if you see anything that's bad, and you don't protest about it, that makes you a coward. And I thought about that, and I said to myself, now how would I know anything about that? And then we got Trump for president. But you, as a Christian, should stand up. Stand up. We're going to have to all repent of things that we did not do. So when sin is being committed openly, we are admittedly supposed to stand against it. To speak out against it. To have the guts to stand up and look that sin and that person in the face and say, look, that's not right. And does that, does that make sometimes their anger turn against you? Yeah, it does. It does. But you know what? You rely on Christ. Rely on Jesus and lift the prayer up and ask the Lord to take care of it for you. But you stand. And then you should have heard the song, the song that they sang today. Stand. And when you can't stand anymore, keep standing. Because it all takes for sin, all it takes for sin to progress is for good men to remain silent. Which brings us to the importance of what we should do about generational curses. Yeah. Generational curses, ladies and gentlemen, are caused by familiar spirits and are passed on from one generation to the next. Now it's important to understand that you're not guilty of any sin that somebody else has committed against you or your ancestors committed, but because of their sin, Satan may have gained access to your family. Ladies and gentlemen, when, you gotta be careful. When you sin, you open a door. Do you understand what I'm saying? King Saul was sinning back in the day, old Israel. God gave him an evil, wicked spirit. So it's, it was just driving him crazy. Do you know that God sometimes allows that to happen to us? When I was smoking crack, I smoked crack for years and nothing was happening. I'd just get high and everything was cool. Run around the whole place. I'm smoking. Didn't matter. Just smoking. And then God says, you know what? I'm going to stop you from smoking. And what he did was he allowed every time that I picked up the pipe and hit it, a door would open up and I would see shadows running around on the wall. Now, some of you know what I'm talking about. If you've been, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. See, I'm telling you, this is the truth. And we think that we know what's happening. It's not an hallucination. Those were demonic creatures that were running out around in my place. And I couldn't call anybody to get rid of them except Jesus. They had nobody that could spray anything to get rid of the roaches. <laughs> You know, these things are around. What I'm trying to say, ladies and gentlemen, is that the doors that we open up, we get opened up by the things that we do, the sins that we can that we commit. Be careful. Amen? Be careful. Understand. Learn from this. Because I'm telling you, when you hit these streets out here, the dope man's gonna be out here and he's gonna try to give you something that will make you see what I saw. And you don't wanna see these things. Amen? 
Amen. So, this declaration I'm going to read to you and then I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, tie it off. It says, in the name and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command Satan and all evil spirits to release me in order that I can be free to know and choose to do the will of God. As children of God seated with Christ in the heavenlies, we agree that every enemy of the Lord Jesus Christ is bound to silence. We say to Satan and all his evil workers that you cannot inflict any pain or in any way prevent God's will from being accomplished in my life. Ladies and gentlemen, you need to understand if you're a, a child of God, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you are covered. You are protected. You are, you are loved. And He puts angels around you to protect you, to make sure. So what does that mean? When you're out here walking around, you're protected. But what does that mean? Don't go into the dark corners out there where you know things are happening. Stay out of those dark corners. Amen? It's in those dark corners where people get hurt. It's in those dark corners where people buy bad dope. I got a lady friend of mine right now that's been buying bad crystal. And now she's all wigged out. So watch yourselves and understand God is with you. Do not stand and let nothing happen in front of you without you standing up. God and saying something, God will watch out for you. Thank God. My name is Anthony Stallworth, and I'm a senior pastor at Central City Community Church of the Nazarene. We're located at 419 East 6th Street, downtown Los Angeles, on the corner of 6th and San Pedro. We are a church that serves the Skid Row community. So I'm sure that you can imagine that it's difficult for us to support our ministry with the tithes and the offerings. If today's message has helped you, perhaps you would like to come alongside Central City and prayerfully consider helping support this ministry by sending your tax-deductible gift to Central City Community Church, P.O. Box 13273, Los Angeles, California, 90013. Thank you.